Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so we're diving deep and getting into all of these um, lower gastrointestinal disorders. And believe it or not, we still have more left. <laughs> and so um, I'll tell you, as you're doing this, it's really helpful to start making tables, just watching like 20 videos back to back, a bunch of different diseases, or trust me, when I do these lectures, it's like the most so soul sucking lectures and really hard to get through. So for, um, you know, as a teacher, it's hard to get through. I can only imagine as a learner, what it would be like to try to process all of this. So I definitely find um, taking breaks in between to process and differentiate these is super helpful. Um, so the next disease we're going to focus on is what's called diverticular disease. In diverticular disease, there's two main parts of this. There's what's called diverticulosis and diverticulitis. Um, so the issue of what's going on here, the last thing we talked about was constipation, too much pressure. Um, so this is a perfect disorder to talk about next because this is too much pressure. Um, but what happens is instead of like hemorrhoids and stuff like what we talked about, too much pressure in the bowel can also lead to these um, out pockets. Um, of um, it's like literally pockets in the bowel. Like if you look from the inside, which I have it on one of the other slides, um, it literally looks like holes in the intestines, but it's just like these pockets that show up on the outside of the intestines as a result of too much pressure. Think of like a balloon blows up because um, there's too much pressure in the intestines. And so people that are going to be at risk for that, this are gonna be anyone who has like um, any sort of constipation, uh, risk factors, so things like a low fiber diet, sedentary lifestyle, um, the lifestyle factors like smoking and drinking, um, obesity, weak immune system, things like that, and just a few terms to go through. So like a diverticula is just one of those like pockets um, and on its own, usually no problems. And again, it's in weak areas of the colon. Um, and I should also mention this is um, primarily going to be in the left lower quadrant. We'll talk more about that. But yes, um, it's in the colon versus like it's not anywhere in the uh, in the um, intestines. Um, and then, like I said, the two main things we're going to focus on. And so you want to pay close attention to the slides as I'm going through and um, really looking at uh, what do you call them? Um, uh, we caught up with the diverticulosis, like some slides are just about diverticulosis. Some slides are about diverticulitis. Um, there's kind of like, there's a, there's a big difference in how we treat and approach them. One is not really a problem. One is a very big problem. And so um, you definitely want to uh, work on differentiating that or looking at, um, okay, like which disease is this talking about? So in other words, try not to get them mixed up. So diverticulosis, I always remember diverticulosis, there's a low chance of anything bad happening. Um, so with diverticulosis, um, you have a multiple of those pockets but there is, uh, they're not uh, inflamed. There's nothing going on with them. We'll talk about this, but usually there's no symptoms. Where diverticulitis is, is when one or more of those pockets becomes inflamed and they can become inflamed because food gets stuck in there um, or they get irritated uh, just because like, just like the bowels can get irritated from diet and other things too. So um, what would we expect for diverticulosis? Like I said, normally no symptoms. It's just a bunch of pockets. And this is that picture I talked about where you can see like if you're looking from the inside, it looks like just a bunch of holes. Um, and so um, those that do have symptoms of diverticulosis, they might complain of some abdominal pain, might have bloating or changes in their bowel habits. Um, with diverticulitis, what we're going to notice is, again, because remember I told you this is a left lower quadrant issue. It's like the descending colon issue um, that they're going to have acute pain and a mass in their left lower quadrant. It's that inflammation that's really, it's not an actual mass that's there. It's the inflamed diverticula creates like a mass-like feeling. And um, they can have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and even like systemic signs of like infection, fever, things like that. So my priority assessments for these patients, um, again, here we want to differentiate diverticulosis, a low chance of anything happening. Um, I just want to assess in general what's their stool patterns, their bowel habits, how often are they going, 
Um, are they having constipation, that kind of thing. And then I also want to assess their diet. Um, you know, is it a low fiber diet, high fiber diet? How much fluid are they intaking? Probably also want to assess in general their um, activity habits. Are they moving and things like that? And then assessing for other abdominal symptoms, like seeing if things are getting worse. Like we talked about sometimes they can have pain, bloating, et cetera. Um, so we just want to kind of take a look at that. And then with the reticulitis, remember that it's the itis. So there's the inflammation going on. And so for them, you're going to do the same assessments, except you want to add in that we're going to look for fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Um, pain assessment is also going to be very important here because pain is going to be a bigger issue for them. And then um, again, looking for those um, signs of infection. So um, to diagnose or to um, find out more about diverticulosis or litis, um, to visualize them, we can do things like a colonoscopy or CT scan. Um, and then we're probably going to be checking some labs. We're looking for infection, like with white blood cell count. If they're nauseous, vomiting, diarrhea, we may um, be checking electrolytes. And again, maybe concerned for dehydration. Um, so uh, creatinine or kidney function is always good to check if we're worried about dehydration. So um, diverticular disease in general is better if there's signs of decreased pressure in the bowel. So if they're having soft, warm stools, um, less symptoms like no bloating, pain, discomfort. Um, and if it's diverticulitis, of course, you know, the less pain or no signs of infection or no signs of complications. It's going to get worse if there's um, signs of worsening abdominal pressure. So continued or worsening constipation. If their symptoms are increasing or getting worse. And then, um, of course, you want to be looking for any signs of infection or peritonitis. Um, overall, now for the diverticulosis, which again is the low chance of having any problems, um, we're just going to be doing lifestyle stuff. Think this is how the same way that we treat constipation. So increase your fluid, increase your fiber, um, get moving, um, weight reduction if possible. Uh, if needed to prevent constipation, we can use stool softeners or those bulk forming laxatives that are not the stimulant ones. We really want to stay away from you know that dependence upon a laxative. Um, in order to have a bowel movement. But the other thing that's different for this one is, is um, decreasing fat in red meat has also been shown specifically to help with um, diverticulosis. So think pretty much we're preventing constipation with diverticulosis. We don't want to make things worse. Where diverticulitis, we're actually focused, this is like an acute issue. So like no one's coming into the hospital with an acute management of diverticulosis because there's nothing, no problems there. There's no inflammation, there's no issues. Um, but where diverticulitis um, that this is something that people are actually very commonly admitted to the hospital for. Um, and um, with this, effectively, we have these, I call them like ticking time bombs that are in that descending colon or that left lower quadrant. And um, they could burst, they could rupture. And remember, this gets back to that whole, uh, we haven't talked it in depth yet. It will be in my inflammatory bowel video. Um, but it's the... Um, uh, what do you call it? Like the peritonitis, we're worried about um, the uh, like abscesses forming, you know, um, leakage of infection and spilling of things out into the peritoneal cavity, which could lead to sepsis and death. So we don't like, these are ticking time bombs. So if they're ticking time bombs, I don't want to put anything um, uh, you know, I don't want them swallowing or eating anything because that's going to cause peristalsis or contractions of their bowels, which can lead to the bursting of these. I also don't want to stick anything up their butt. And what I mean by that is like no enemas, suppositories, or anything else that's going to stimulate them and make them go to the bathroom. I just really, I don't want to speed anything up. I don't want any, um, you know, uh, bowel contractions, things like that. Um, I don't want to stimulate the bowels. I want to relieve pressure, ease up the pressure on the bowel. So usually these patients are going to be NPO, NG tube, IV hydration. I'm going to keep a close um, eye on their I's and O's to make sure that they are staying hydrated. And then um, these patients are usually going to need antibiotics and commonly need surgery. Like in this picture, they're doing a colon resection where they literally have to take off the part that has the inflamed um, diverticula. And then um, not everyone needs that, but sometimes they do need that. It just depends on the severity. And then I'm going to be there managing their pain. If they're nauseous and stuff, obviously antiemetics, good oral care, that kind of stuff. Okay. Ah, oh, there's no, oh, okay. Never mind. I combined them. I was just seeing, ah, sometimes I forget uh, stuff that I do for myself. So anyway, that's the end of diverticular disease. I will see you next for inflammatory bowel. Bye.